Hello everybody, how you doing today? This is Deacon Sakona Prince of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church of the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr., our pastor. And I'm going to be reviewing the Sunday School lesson coming out of the Faith Pathways books. But before we get started, let's get started in a word of prayer. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to study your word. We thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us and for how you kept us since last we met. We pray next right now that you would just God, be with us as we go into this study. God, give us wisdom and insight. Give us understanding. God, help us to understand what you are saying to us even today. And God, help us to live a life that's pleasing to you. And let us be a light in a dark world. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and for his sake. Amen. 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 Today we're studying Lesson 10. The date is August 7, 2022. And the unit is unit three. And the unit subject is the great hope of the saints. This lesson subject is no more tears. The in fact, devotional reading comes from Isaiah chapter 32, verses 9 through 20. The background scripture is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. And our printed passage is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Our key verse states, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. The lesson aim states, as a result of experiencing this lesson, that you should be able to do these things. Examine the unique writing classification, apocalypse, that characterized the book of Revelations in order to Discern how to understand and apply its message to daily life. Contemplate the creation of a new heaven and a new earth for the hope that this version holds for the faithful. And embrace the peace of God that begins in this life with Jesus and continues in God's new creation. Amen. Now, normally this would be a time when I would grab my glasses, but I can't seem to find them. So I'm going to be holding my book way out, but uh, God willing, we'll be able to get through this. Okay, the introduction says, The external backdrop against which this lesson is composed is distressing, depressing, oppressing, and suppressing. In fact, the media continues to broadcast more to discourage than encourage people around the world. America has witnessed the horrific fact, resurfacing of hidden and restrained racism. Politics is riddled with sharp, irrational divisions among along party lines. The effects of an invisible yet deadly Pestilence creates a global disruption and claims the lives of many millions around the globe. People's personal tragedy abound in people's lives without discrimination. Tears of sorrow, distress, anger, and fear continue to flow. But the spoken and unspoken questions from many are how long and when will these things cease? Where is a safe place from the pain and suffering? In fact, believers who are students of the Bible know that in fact, declining in fact, morality and spiritual carelessness will continue and worsen. Our Savior Jesus Christ warned, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains for the intolerable anguish and the times of unprecedented trouble. And that's from the Mark chapter 24, verse 8, from the Amplified Version. Tears were inevitable. Tears will, tears will inevitably continue like, to fill the eyes while we live in this world. God's children are encouraged to endure and not question. The like the motivation to persevere, like rather than complain, worry, and be overcome by fear, is God's promise 
of a personal or of a prepared place where tears and sorrow were no more will be no more. This promise is to be accepted and believed because we made it. God said that he would wipe away every tear from every eye. That is, ensure that there is no, there's no reason to shed tears of sorrow and that he can and that he cannot lie. In fact, believers greatest challenge that because of his promise is to intentionally pursue and develop their spirituality. In fact, the more spiritual, in fact, that is, in fact, the more like Christ that, in fact, believers become, the easier that they will find it to live joyful and confident, confidently among the chaos. Also, Christians live our spiritual our spirituality will serve as an invisible witness to others as models of perseverance and faith in God and his promises. A timely reminder. Our analysis of the biblical text says an external renewal, an eternal renewal. In fact, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And the word of the Lord reads, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. The commentary says, When God created the world, it was ideally prepared for humankind. This ideal physical environment and his intimate relationship with humanity were intended to last forever. Sin entered the picture and disrupted its relationship and negatively affected creation. The Apostle Paul substantiated this as truth in his letter to the Roman Christians. From the beginning, God never intended to allow sin to reign and continue to block his eternal plan for humankind. And all his cre and, and all he created. Sin was ultimately, in fact, defeated in fact, by the death and resurrection of God's Son, paving the way for the day when he would make all things new. John describes a vivid revelation of this in fact renewal in Revelation 21. As the chapter opens, John has just described the judgment sentencing and punishment of all existing evil. He begins by stating that he saw a new heaven and a new earth, by replacing the first one, <coughs> excuse me, that was, that had vanished. God makes a complete transformation of everything. The universe will be destroyed and replaced with a new one eternal creation new in the text is quantitative new in character better than the old free from sins contamination <coughs> excuse me probably should have got some water it says interestingly john observed that there is no more sea in ancient times Hey, let me go get some water. I'm, I'm sorry. I got to do this because otherwise we'll be here all day. I'm going to pause. 
And we're back. Interestingly, John observes that there is no more sea. In ancient times, in fact, the sea represented chaos, disorder, destruction, evil, and separation. The sea, the sea's symbolic absence coincides, in fact, with the new earth's character and the er eradication of how it was perceived and feared by John's audience. John also sees the holy city, New Jerusalem, in fact, descended from heaven, would in fact descended from God out of heaven and pictured as a bride adorned for her husband. In contrast to the original city, the New Jerusalem is characterized by righteousness and is prepared for God and is, is prepared by God for his people. The descriptor like reference to the bride adorned for her husband symbolically like represents the absence of anything unholy inhabiting the New Jerusalem. Next, the loud, a loud voice arrests John's attention, announcing that God will make his dwelling among his people. God previously promised to abide among his people, in fact, foreshadowed in the tabernacle, the temple, and Christ, the incarnate word, is a real is a real a reality <laughs> in his holy city. <clears throat> in fact, the voice also announced in fact dramatic changes in the new heaven and earth by identifying what will not exist in them. Take no more tears, no more death. These change marks the end of all in fact related to the original fallen creation. From his throne, God speaks to John and confirms the absolute certainty of what he has seen and heard. He commanded John to record his word because they are fulfilled, they are faithful and true. As God has done in the beginning, he now speaks the certainty of in fact, making all things new. For John's original audience, the truthworthiness of God's word was a source of confident hope. In fact, they should be the same for believers now as well. However, in fact, they must not lull us into a pie in the sky attitude and way of living. The assurance of living eternally in a place of no more with God should be accepted as a call to holy living, encouraging in good works and seeking the salvation of those destined to eternal separation from God while the opportunity remains. So here we see how John is painting a picture of what heaven is going to look like, but he's painting it from the vision. He's painting it with his words, but from the vision that God showed him. So he is recording and telling, not something that he imagined, but something that God revealed to him. Uh, and it's recorded for us in the book of Revelations. And so we see that God's intent is fully and finally realized because of his word being true and him being able to bring it to pass. So there is an eternal renewal that's coming. The way things are today with everything that's going on in the world, with not just even the pandemic, but even now, you know, we have another health threat. All of those sorrows, all of those fears, all of the things that cause us to stay up at night, it's going to be wiped away. There's going to be no more reason for us to cry. And that's that to me shows the heart of God. I, I've said this time and time again. So many times, in fact, we see the hand of God, but we miss the heart of God. God never intended for the world to be in the state that it's in right now. Sin caused that. 
that as it entered the picture, as it entered uh, mankind, it caused the fall of that creation. But God is going to renew and restore that. And that's the hope of every believer. And so we have to continue to be faithful and steadfast in the thing that God has called us to do. Even with how bad things look, even with how hopeless it seems, we have to be willing and able to stay the course and to do what God has called and given us to do. Because I tell you that without God's help, without his guidance, without his, his actual input, what can we do? How can we make a difference? How can we change not only our lives, but the lives of those people that don't know the Lord? We have to stay connected to him so we can be that beacon light of hope for a dying world. And lessons like this reminds us that this is not the end. We have a hope that goes beyond where we are right now and what we're going through. So that's something that we need to know, not only know, but be willing to share with our fellow man. The next section says contrasting destinies. Revelation chapter 21, verses 5 through 9. And the word of the Lord reads, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountains of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials filled with the seven last plagues and talk with me saying, come hither, I will show thee like the bride, the lamb's wife. Amen. The commentary says, God's work of creating a new heaven and earth is a direct parallel to his creative work in the beginning. God promised all he had made was good and complete. John is told to record the words spoken as trustworthy and true. The one seated on the throne proclaims the absolute finality of his decree to make all things new and affirming it is done. His statement is in its present tense, confirming that what he said is so sure that he can speak of future events as already finished and lasting. But because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things, he is both the, the origin and completion of all things and can be trusted to control perfectly and sovereignly everything. God concludes this confirming sin, this, this comforting sentence by promising that the water of life eternal life to all who desire to receive it. Note at the at the request for in fact receive or that the requisite for receiving this gracious gift, anyone who are thirst for it, or anyone who thirsts for it. The offer is given, but accepting it is an individual choice. Those who overcome it faithfully maintain a relationship with Jesus Christ, will fact, become God's children and heirs of the blessing, in fact, described in verse 7. Overcomers are not those who live perfectly. If, we, if that were possible, in fact, they are those who 
constantly live by faith. That's so, so true. The commentary goes on by saying that contrastly, many stubborn, many stubbornly choose the opposite path and its consequences. John begins this significant list with those who are cowards. In this context, the cowards are those who chose to allow self and personal security to prevent their faithful they're faithfully following Christ in the presence of his enemies. In fact, the rest of this list in fact, represents all sin and rebellion against God. Instead of receiving the waters of life, this group will receive the lake of fire. <coughs> Excuse me. The contrasting fates of these two groups intensifies an and importance of two essential things. One is, in fact, believing in the name of Jesus now. The other is the mission of, to evangelize, in fact, the lost. His promise of eternal life and eternal death are, trust, are trustworthy as his promise to make all things new. The choice of one or the other is the, is, 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 is the decision of those who hear the Lord's word. In fact, the remaining verses in this chapter that contains that magnificent descriptions of New Jerusalem <coughs> excuse me of the New Jerusalem <coughs> in fact the remaining verses in this chapter contains a magnificent fact description of the New Jerusalem at beginning with verse 9 one of the angels Holding, in fact, the bold judgments commands John to tour the city described as the bride of the Lamb. The bride is the holy city itself, the New Jerusalem, in fact, where the redeemed will abide with God. The imagery of marriage expresses the depth of the relationship between God and his people. <clears throat> So, you get a picture of those who are faithful to God and those who are not. Those who are believers and those who are unbelievers. Those who are dedicated and those who are undedicated. This section is talking about the uh, contrasting destinies. Um, and it, it's really up to us where, where we stand. It's up to you and I. I know that Jesus often talked about, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. We have a responsibility to continue down this path in which we chose to go in the first place after the Lord called us. We responded to his call, we accepted his gift of salvation, but the responsibility then falls on us to walk out that salvation. Now, the thing of it is that God doesn't he doesn't have us do that alone. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. So we have help. We can't just say, well, God wanted me to do something I couldn't do on my own. We have help. We just have to agree and have to ask for the help that we have already. And so in asking for the help in those areas, we can then live a life that God intended for us to live. And we can reach our destination that he intended for us to get to. And not just the destination, but the reward that he has for all of us for our faithfulness and our dedication. So when I think about this particular passage of scripture, I think about how how there are definitely two different two different destinies because there are two different sets of people. There are those who, again, are faithful and dedicated to God, but then are also those who have who have not accepted his gift of salvation. And so there has to be two separate destinies because otherwise otherwise it's just just things is business as usual so as god makes all things new and even jesus gave this example that you can't put new wine in old wine skins because the thing about wine was as it ferments it, it expands and if the wine skin is old and set in its ways it's going to crack and burst but if it's new it will it will expand with the wine 
My point is God makes all things new. And so the new heaven and the new earth are for the, the in fact, believers who have been made new. Our, our actual inner man has been made new by our transformation and acceptance of Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we are the ones that are, in, that are ushered into this new heaven and this new earth, which God has prepared for his people. And so I just want to make sure that you understand that God has something for you and for I, if we're believers, that is going to blow our mind. And again, there are going to be no more tears. The closing thought says, in fact, the time in which we live certainly increased longing and anticipation of in fact, the renewal of all things among the faithful. God's guarantee of this of his future certainty should also increase one's desire to have a more intimate like, relationship with him. His revelation of the glorious future for us is an urgent call to be about what Christ has commanded all believers in fact, to do while waiting for his fulfillment. Our rejoicing about living in a place with no more of of no more must be accomplished by focused efforts to evangelize the world so that others can receive the gift of eternal life and so this particular book this passage of scripture they are in fact reminders of the urgent call for us to share the gospel to share the good news of Jesus Christ and not just in word, but in deed, you know, we can help people. We can, he can actually be for folks. What in fact what's needed and what's necessary. And what I mean by that is he can be a lifeline. In fact, we can be a light in darkness. We can, can show them how we got to where we are by our relationship with Christ. And that's all we have to do is just be the light. Don't make our light shine. Like the song said, let your light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to make it shine because it's not mine to make shine. God gave it to me. I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> I mean, that's the words of the song, but it's so true. We have to let our light shine. But as we let our light shine, men and women, boys and girls can see their way out of darkness. And then get to a better place and a better space in a relationship with God. They can come to know him in a part of their sins. And they can be a part of the number when the saints go marching in. The section that says your life. It says, how often have you reflected on God's promise of a new home for his children? If you have, then what have you been convinced fact to do here and now employees work diligently in anticipation of a check at the end of their work cycle the saints future hope should motivate each of us to work diligently visibly obey his commands and point the unsaved to christ so again we have an obligation we have responsibility we have a duty to point people to the savior that's what we should be doing even today. The section that says your world. Admittedly, it is difficult to imagine a world absent of anything sad or sorrowful. Yet God has promised it and it is already done. What can you do this week as proof of your confident of your confident faith in the promise in this promise to encourage exhort and comfort others who may have lost hope or never had or or in fact never heard about what is in store for the redeemed commit to practice active visible anticipation this week by in fact ministering to, in fact, to someone in or one or more of the ways uh, of these ways so again, in fact, we just have an obligation and a responsibility 
to touch a dying world, to seek and save that which is lost for the Lord by introducing them to him. The closing prayer says, thank you, Father, for the absolute certainty of eternal communication. In fact, with you, or I'm sorry, eternal communion <laughs> with you in the New Jerusalem. In fact, we realize that our unworthiness and our grateful and are grateful for you for your making it possible through Jesus Christ. Perfect the Son. While we wait, use us as your fact, representatives fact, to share this great hope with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, as you can tell, I kind of struggle with that because again, I don't have my glasses, but by next time I'm going to have them. So we won't have these kind of issues. But the reality is that this lesson talks about no more tears and God is going to wipe away everything that has caused sorrow, hurt, harm, and even danger and going to put us in a place that is problem and trouble free. And I know it's hard for us to imagine. It's hard for me to imagine that even now. But I know that God is he's he's no short of his word and he will do what he said he's going to do. So we as believers, we have a responsibility to live just like that. Like we know that God's word is true and that he is going to right every wrong. He's going to straighten everything that's crooked. He's going to level every playing field. God is going to make all things new. And so for you and I, we just need to make sure that we are pouring into ourselves and then pouring into others. How do we pour into ourselves? We do that by getting into his word, by getting into his presence, by, by praying and by in fact, meditation, by coming to church, by being a part of worship service, by giving him what's rightfully his, which is praise and adoration. And in doing so, like the song said, I went down to the fountain and my soul got another dip. Our part is to go to God. He fills us up, but then after we get filled up, then he wants us to pour out what he gave us into a thirsty world. So we have that responsibility. And we, and we set an example for those who don't know the Lord by doing just that, by living a life that's pleasing to him. So I want to encourage you that this lesson here, it lets us know that God is not done. He's not finished. This is not the end. God is still on the throne. He's still in control. So our hope should not be in our bank accounts or in our connections or in the economy or in, or, or in politics, but it should be in God himself because he has the last say so. And there's nothing too hard for God and he could do anything but fail. And listen, in fact, let's close in a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for this timely reminder that you're going to create a world that has no more tears. That we have an opportunity, Father God, to live in, in a place, Father God, that is just paradise. It's perfect because you're going to be there and we're going to have your presence and we are going to just be able to enjoy what you intended for us when you created everything. Now, Lord God, we ask that you would just allow us to God to live out our call, to, in fact, to live out the charge that you placed on our life, to be able to pour into the lives of those who don't know you, to be able to actually be that beacon light of hope for a dying world. God, help us to let our light shine, not make it shine, but just let it shine wherever we are, wherever you allow us to go. Allow us to, Father God, to show your grace, God, as as you as you so freely given to us and we freely receive, we should be able to give it back and to give it to a dying world. Help us to be instruments in your hand to touch, God, those who don't know you, God, to point them to you, to draw them to you, God, as you use us in your service. God, allow us to, Father God, that chance to God to see the fruits of our labor and to see, Father God, those things which you've laid to our charge, how they come to pass. God, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, creating us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. God, help us to be faithful and dedicated to you and to honor you've laid to our charge. Father, we thank you right now. We bless you. We praise you. We adore you. We magnify you. We honor you. We lift you up. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, this is Deacon Sacconi, Prince of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church by the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. our pastor. 
I want to thank Pastor May for allowing us this opportunity to share these Sunday school lessons with you. I also want to thank my co-labor in this endeavor, Reverend Frederick Robinson, and how God continues to use him to actually pour into us as, as only he can. I also want to thank God for the superintendent of our Sunday school, Deacon L.K. Wimbush, for his role in helping us to become better Christians by through education, through, through Christian education. And it's so, so important. I want to thank God for allowing me to be a part of one of his greatest churches, the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church. Um, it's a privilege to call Liberty my church home. I also want to thank God for my wife, Yolanda, for all of our children, in fact, Marcellus, Kristen, Jessica, Taylor, and Jonathan. And I want to thank God for you. Listen, I actually would like and share this video so somebody else can get this valuable lesson that God is going to make a world where there are no more tears. And listen, we'll talk to you later. God bless. Bye.